Good evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the launch of Joining the Dots, which is an unauthor unauthorized biography of Pravin Gordon. <clears throat> um, the uh, discussion uh, is going to be facilitated by Nishan Belton, who uh, is an activist of some 40 years standing, going back to the days of the UDF, um, and is at present, and has been since 2008, the executive director of the Ahmed Kathrada Foundation, which is a foundation that in fact plays a role in the Pravin Gordon story, which I'm sure that um, our guests will discuss. Nishan is going to be talking to the two authors of the book, two authors, two veteran South African journalists, um, covered many, many stories. Um, Jonathan Anser, um, who once edited Grocott's Mail, has subsequently uh, become a, a writer of some very interesting books, one in particular about Craig Williamson, the apartheid uh, quote-unquote super spy, um, and another one on a whole lot of other spies of the apartheid era and various uh, forms of skullduggery in that era. Uh, Chris Whitfield is someone who has edited a number of publications, the Cape Times, the Argus, Weekend Argus, in fact was the editor-in-chief of the Argus newspaper in the uh, group, uh, the Cape Division, um, for a time. He's also the co-author of a book called Paper Tiger, which um, is a very interesting account of uh, the Iqbal survey takeover of the independent group and um, what happened then. So thank you very much for joining us. I hope that um, we have uh, an interesting discussion. I'm sure we will. And uh, now I'd like to hand over to Nishan and, and, and let him take the discussion from here. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sean. Um, greetings to everybody. Um, greetings specifically uh, to Jonathan and Chris. And let me just also thank you for having done this particular book. Um, I know it wasn't easy. And, and perhaps just as a kickoff, it would be useful just to share with us the process of writing this book with somebody who perhaps as, as reluctant, as, 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 as difficult to, 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 to have gotten to as, as, as Pravin. So just the process of writing, researching this book, and, and, and what were some of the most surprising things that emerged at the end of this particular project? Uh, that, that you did not anticipate uh, when you started it. So just briefly from both of you. Okay, um, I'll, I'll start. Um, it, it, it was very difficult to, as you said, uh, you know, uh, uh, the minister doesn't like to talk about himself. He was a reluctant uh, subject. In fact, um, we, we had already started and it got, and it got um, uh, qu quite far down the road before we started interviewing him. And we had made uh, a, a number of a, a attempts to, to uh, interview him. Um, and the, the messages that came back were, were the same. Pravin doesn't like to talk about himself. Pravin is very shy. Uh, the minister, you know, is, 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 is very reluctant. And eventually we wore him down and he agreed to speak to us. But it, it, it is an unauthorized uh, biography in the sense that although he, he cooperated with us, um, he had no say and no control over the direction of the interviews, over the content at all. He never got to see anything. He couldn't tell us who to interview and who not to interview. So it really was an independent project. And I, I think, you know, Chris and I worked quite closely on what we wanted to achieve um, in, in this project. And um, we wanted to tell his story, a, a warts and all story, looking at his trajectory from activist, pharmacist, SARS commissioner, uh, or you know, before that negotiator, uh, SARS commissioner, minister, and eventually state capture, you know, a fighter against state capture. And then, of course, the more recent years. And for me, the most surprising thing, or the, the thing that I really learned about, um, that intrigued me was was the, the the activists in Natal in the 1970s and the role that uh, uh, Pravin played 
in 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 that era, that political era, and how that emerged. Um, I, I I found it really fascinating um, uh, how this group of activists, quite a, a, a large number of activists, uh, the impact that they had on the future of South Africa or, or, or in South Africa's um, uh, history um, and, and their courage. And I think it's a story that hasn't really been told. Well, it, it was a story that I didn't really know about. So that was the, the thing that that surprised me. Another thing that surprised me is, is despite his political prominence, that uh, Pravin is is, is a, ultimately a very shy person. Mm. Good. No, wonderful. Um, you asked about the, the, the technical aspect of, of writing a book together. Um, we researched on Zoom, we interviewed people. We did a lot of research, obviously, online and, and through various, bo and various books. Um, and then uh, we, we kind of decided who would do what. We decided that there's a massive book in this. It could be several volumes. We had to boil it down into one. And then we effectively wrote a series of essays. And we decided, for example, I'd covered the multi-party negotiations as a journalist. So I did that chapter. And um, and yeah, that that that's the that's the background to how we worked as writers. And then in terms of surprise, like Jonathan, I hadn't quite been aware. Although I grew up in KZN and worked as a journalist there, I hadn't quite been aware of the depth of the role that uh, was being played in that in 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 the KZN and his colleagues, obviously, and his comrades. And then also the fact that he was he's played an extraordinary role in vital moments in our history. Um, he popped up at negotiations. Before that, he uh, played a role in contextualizing mass mobilization as part of the struggle. And then um, in the negotiations, through to his fight against state capture, he's played a very significant role. No, you know, I, I, I think likewise, um, as somebody who would have been on the on, on, on the receiving end of the work that was started in KZN. I didn't I didn't understand all of the details of where my own civic activism, uh, its roots would have come from, uh, until I read about what Mumoniat and Ali Musa and others, and and their connections and the stuff that they had brought down to to Johannesburg, and imparted to all of us. So so what what I want to just get a sense. How would you summarize uh, Pravin's contribution to the liberation struggle from UDW to Operation Bula? And, and, and what's the consistent uh, features of his activism across all those areas and sites of struggle and episodes of struggle? What, what's the commonality that, that you've been able to distill from the work that you've done? I think it's a sense of his sense of of being an incredible strategist. I think that's the common thread that runs through uh, his political life as an activist. Um, from you know the, 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 that one incident at at Tin Town where uh, the Mgeni River flooded and uh, 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 flooded this this community, and how he was able with with others, it wasn't him alone, but how they were able to use that incident to, uh, to develop this and pioneer this concept of mass mobilization, how they then worked with the community. Initially, it was just doing a re relief work, a social relief, raising funds, bringing groceries, but how they saw, and, and, and I think this was, you know, the people that we spoke to all pointed to to Pravin as the person who pioneered this concept of of using that incident to develop communities and and to help communities wage struggle against you know for better living conditions for better houses for better access for for education for schools um, and and then how that developed into a range of organisations um, and that that was a very strategic. Uh, uh, aspect to the, to the struggle, and it, and, it, and it essentially was rolled out into, as you say, into other areas, into you know formerly Transvaal and uh, and Cape Town or you know the Cape, 
Um, and at, at, at another thing, another aspect, another thread is 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 Pravin's courage. Um, he, you know, he, he he stood up to the security police. He was, uh, you know, detained. He was tortured, um, and he was he, he never backed down. He, you know, from the time he was a student, he stood his ground, and um, I think he, he continued to stand his ground. But also, you know, so, sort of the way he was able to harness the power of the collective. Um, I, I think that's that's an, an, a third thread. Good. So, if we if we move on to the multi-party negotiations, did, did you did you come to understand how firstly Pravin got to be appointed as the chair of that multi-party forum, given that he had come there as a delegate from the NIC? Uh, so, did, did you uncover information that perhaps is not in the book? that gives a bit more insights into how he comes into this role and then how he plays this role in a way that gets the sufficient consensus, which is this unique South African concept to actually get the end results around the election date and, and the adoption of the draft constitution. He seems to have been the kind of person that held all of this together. Um, but, but perhaps there, there, there's stuff here that, that you might want to share as, as further insights. Yeah, I think um, the, the m most insights we got into that were from Rolf Mayer, interestingly, uh, because as Rolf describes how he and Praveen were on different sides of the of the of the the, the coin there, and um, he acknowledges the fact that Praveen was an extremely competent and um, gifted, in fact. Uh, leader of the negotiations. And I think that's what, what uh, drove him forward. Rolf said, for example, that he was quite shocked when he heard that Praveen was a pharmacist because he thought that he was a lawyer. He thought he was a trained lawyer. So um, it was, I think it was that skill and that ability that took him, that, that, that put him forward and his colleagues around him. I remember sitting there, the, the other negotiators from the ANC uh, recognized his ability and, um, and and put him forward and then the sufficient consensus issue um i'm not quite sure who individually came up with that when people did tell us it was Praveen's uh, initiative but they are but he himself says no it was broader it was anc people um but what he was a master at was uh making sufficient consensus work make making decisions on the basis of sufficient consensus. And he would give, he, how he described, he'd give people um, a lot of leeway, a lot of crowd, uh, space to have their say, and then, he'd, and then he would turn around and say, okay, we've got sufficient consensus, which in effect was, if the ANC and the National Party agreed, you effectively had sufficient consensus, but you had to take the smaller parties along and, um, and get them on board. So, so can I ask all of the viewers um, who, who are here, if you have any questions or, or comments, just post that onto the chat window, please. And, and there'll be sufficient time to, to begin to get responses to, to, to your own questions or comments. In the book, Sandy Africa on page 182 writes about Pravin being the antithesis of Zuma. Um, from all that you've done in the book, what, how would you describe their relationship? What caused the breakdowns? But he, is, 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 is she correct that he comes to represent all that Zuma didn't represent for, for, for many in the country? Okay. Um, I, th I think she is correct. Uh, um, I, I, I think you know we, the, 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 that chapter is really is a setup between, and it is. I think she she's the one who points out it is con convenience um, to to have this juxtaposition of these two figures. Um, you know, it, it's very interesting that they're born on this. For me, I found that very interesting that they're born on the mm -hmm. same day, the twelfth of April, different years. Uh, 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 um, Pravin was born in nineteen forty nine, um, but 
you know, they share a birthday, they share a province. Um, and, and they met in, in, in the early 70s after Zuma came off Robben Island. Um, and, and they were comrades. Uh, 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 at that point, um, Pravin had a, a unit. He headed up this unit called Providence, uh, an ANC unit. And they were, they were, as he describes it, he, as he calls them, they were political entrepreneurs. Nobody was telling them what to do uh, or how to do it. And so they were just trying to learn as much as possible from from wherever they could. And this this you know group of of, of prisoners coming off Robin Island, people like Sunny Singh and Mac Maharaj, and of course Jacob Zuma, they were they were learning from them. But they were also helping uh, uh, Zuma, who 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 was at that point recruiting people from for for MK. They were taking him, transporting him. Uh, province group was transporting him to to Harry Guala, who was uh, Zuma's MK handler. And um, at some point, Zuma hears that the security police are after him. And it was with the help of Pravin's group that uh, he left the country and he goes into exile. And um, they, they still had this relationship uh, in exile. This, you know, they, they still were in, in, you know, in contact. And of course, during Operation Vula, they both played quite central roles. But I think from there, they they start their paths begin to diverge, and um, uh, Azuma sort of comes to represent sort of greed, and he, he he descends into moral bankruptcy, and Pravin takes on 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 a new stature. He becomes Mister Clean, the person who who confronts state capture. And I do think you know, we, we, we spoke to a lot of people and people from his past, uh, Pravin's past, uh, uh, people that he works with now, people in cabinet, and not one person could fault his integrity. Um, and the word that, you know, even people that, you know, uh, uh, kind of didn't get on with him said that he's impeachable, he's incorruptible. And I think that there is that sense that that that, that when Chris and I decide, discussed what we wanted to achieve with this book, we wanted to really test whether there was any dirt, and we couldn't find any. Um, yeah. So I, I think Sandy Africa is correct, and I think uh, we, we the, the facts kind of speak out, speak for themselves. Chris, do you have any views on that? Um, well, yeah, and I broadly, obviously, I uh, agree with Jonathan. I mean, we set out to write a book about a man who we presumed that, I mean, my history of writing politics, I presumed he might have feet of clay, but he didn't, he doesn't. Um, and, and then on the broader question of the Zuma relationship, um, I don't know if they were ever friends. They were comrades, and they were probably close as comrades. But I don't think they were particularly close. And then, of course, the moment when it all broke down, as we as we write about, it was around the nuclear deal. Um, yeah. So, boom. so, so just, just to change track a bit, a big part of the book talks about him, his role in building institutions of democracy. Uh, SARS, finance minister, local government, back to finance, and now at public enterprises. For a pharmacist to come in to be perhaps as competent, as successful, and as he has been across these many areas or these many portfolios, what, 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 what's been the kind of common characteristics that, that would underpin that, that kind of, of, of successful performance if one uses his performance as a, as a kind of yardstick against many of his colleagues and, and others who, who have occupied some of the posts in government? I think he's, he's incredibly thorough, incredibly diligent, uh, very committed. He works very, very hard. I mean, people told us I'd be woken up at 2 o'clock in the morning uh, with an email that, that he'd sent about something he was reading at the time. But I think the driving, the biggest driving factor behind him um, is the fact that he's at heart an activist. So whatever he tackles and whatever he wants to do, he wants to do the best for the people of this country. 
And I think you see that, I mean, he talks at, at SARS, he, he talked about the higher purpose of SARS, um, which, I mean, extraordinary time in our lives. And I can remember thinking it wasn't a bad idea to pay taxes, which I don't think anymore. Um, and then the, the whole way through his, his, his career, in fact, even before he became a minister and he rebuilt those institutions, he was driven by a desire to improve the country, I think. So there's, there's a, there's a, on page 197, I, I thought for me was one of, the, one, of, one of the most striking insights into that perhaps explains a lot that, that we might not understand. But he says decisions are not made by individuals and that he's part of a collective and he's part of, of, a, of a cabinet system and, and people don't seem to understand that, 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 that distinction. Is that what explains perhaps what's been confusion to many around SAA and perhaps positions around much of the state-owned enterprises? Is that this is the collective view, not necessarily his view. Um, you, 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 you might have, uh, have, have, have found something in, in your conversations that, 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 that either confirms that or that, that, that says that he was really, if he was on his own, he would have done something different. Yeah, I, 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 th I think so. Um, it's, we, people close to him would tell us that, for example, on the issues around SOEs, uh, just, it's not a simple decision-making project. You don't sit as a minister and say, okay, I'm going to do this. You have to get the NEC behind you. You have to get the cabinet behind you. And as we all know, the ANC at the moment is not a unified party. So there are different factions uh, fighting against you on top of this complicated decision-making process. So I do think that was a, it, it's, a, it's a very significant factor in all of those, all of those issues. Um, he was very guarded about uh, uh, the SOEs when he discussed them with us. And I think that was a consequence of the fact that he had different, there are different constituencies applying pressure on him. And that would be one of them, two constituencies within the ANC. And then, of course, there's the private sector, which wants to go ahead and privatize, and the trade unions who don't. So there's a lot of, a lot of pressure on him in that level. And taking that a little bit, a little step further, we were asked the other day, um, is Praveen playing a role in the kind of slow movement, the, the perception that we, that uh, uh, the president, Cyril Ramaphosa, is, is moving too slowly? And I think the answer to that, part of the answer anyway, lies in the fact that, uh, that he is also working with a very, very divided party, as someone described it to us, the 51-49 party. And you can't, the 51 can't just go and dance on its own. It's got to drag the 49 along. Yeah, I, I should have also indicated that I do serve on one of the uh, state-owned enterprises, the board of that of the forestry company. And, and I've seen firsthand the kind of engagement between a board and the minister is the shareholder and, and the kind of directions and leadership. But more importantly, the kinds of questions that he asks uh, in board meetings, but also through correspondence, um, I, I think has really put the pressure on performance. And if he's doing that with other state-owned enterprises, uh, I, 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 I can only hope that the turnaround that we've seen at, at the forestry company is something that you will see in, in, in the other SOEs. Um, yeah. You, you write there about, he's not a neoliberal, and then you, you say, well, question mark, what is he? So what, what is kind of province ideology, if, if one were to put it as such? Um, I, uh, I'm, ta I'm taking all the questions now, but you've honing <laughs> in on that I write. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, well, let's start from that position. He's not a neoliberal. He finds it quite annoying that people describe him as a neoliberal and that they associate him with neoliberal policies. So what does that mean? That means he 
is um, in terms of the, the context of, of, for example, the SAEs, I think he believes in a degree of state intervention. And uh, we quote in the book um, Maria Mazzucato, who is a uh, professor uh, at the University College London in the Economics of Innovation and Public Value. And um, on the broad role of the state's role in the economy, she says that our approach is not about more state or less state, but a different type of state, one that is characterized by innovative institutions, embodies public value, and is able to act as an investor of first resort, catalyzing new types of growth, and in doing so, crowd in private sector investment and innovation. And I think that, broadly speaking, uh, is, is the ideo ideology. I mean, it's obviously a very uh, short description, but that broadly is the ideology that he is applying to the SAEs. And I think what you'll find is there will be, uh, this country's got hundreds of SAEs and there are going to be a handful left uh, at the end of the day. And, um, but on the broader question of ideology, I mean, he was obviously driven by an opposition to apartheid. And, uh, and as I said, I think it's a sort of common good which drives him more than anything else. He's um, an activist and he wants the best for the, the range of South Africans. So you, you, you said you were writing a book to talk about the what's and all of Pravin. Where, where in this book are the what's? Uh, <laughs> there seem to be few and far between to find in any of these 200 odd pages. So, yeah, so, so we, we did go looking for it, for it and um, for them. And um, we, did, we, we, we do, I think, document some of his faults. Um, you know, some of the, the people that he's worked with describe him as a micromanager and a, and a, and a slave driver. And uh, there, there are some sort of criticisms about the way he, he works with people. Um, but uh, ultimately, I think the dirt that we really were looking for is about whether there was, you know, a lot of his foes, the EFF and, and, and the like, and the sort of public protector have made some very um, serious allegations against him. And we wanted to, 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 to kind of investigate those allegations, whether there's been a hint of impropriety. And we couldn't find that. And I suppose those were the wards that, that we couldn't find. And instead, we, we painted this picture of somebody who really, as Chris says, is dedicated to this country. And, and that's what we found. And we didn't set out to, to, to do that. It just happened that the people that we that we spoke to, um, and we spoke to a range of people, uh, uh, had very sort of positive uh, things to say about him. So, yeah, I mean, we set out to, to, to discover, is he a clean politician? And uh, I think we can say with confidence that he is. So, so you, you, you would confirm that there's no bank account in Canada um, and, and, and all those accusations that, that were made uh, by, I think, the EFF and others about That's him right, and yeah. his daughter and so forth. Yeah, yeah. Those, are, those are just laughable. They really are. You know, th there was a concerted campaign against him, um, you know, from the time that he started taking on state capture. Uh, the, the, this SARS rogue unit fiction has been thoroughly debunked. The, the Hawks, you know, uh, when they were kind of not independent, uh, targeted him um, w w with also spurious charges. Um, and he's withstood it all. Uh, uh, he's been accused of being part of a cabal. It's all, it's all just kind of people throwing mud at him. And as far as we can tell, none of it has stuck. He, he, w towards the end of the book, Pravin talks about what he would like to see as the outcomes from the Zondo Commission. And I think he makes three or four three or points. Four. Um, would, would those points, would, would they then connect the dots for you as far as he's concerned? If, if the Zondo Commission's reports 
were to talk about how institutions were broken, uh, who were the people exactly involved, uh, and, and would that then conclude his call that he made at Katrada's funeral about the need to join these dots? Uh, and, and does that then close that particular chapter? Well, I, I, I'm not sure if it'll close the chapter because I think this it's, <laughs> that chapter is a, is a huge chapter. Um, and I'm not sure what will close it, but I, I think what he's, you know, the the the, uh, the outcomes. I, I found also that that fascinating. Um, you know, he wa he wants to see. For, we basically he wants us to understand, or he wants the commission to help South Africans understand the mechanisms by which the corruption happened, and to understand that it wasn't only just about, about money that, that that was looted. It was cultures; these institutional cultures were destroyed. People's lives were destroyed, and so I, I think he does want it all to come out. And um, and and I think when when all the the sort of rot comes out, and and hopefully the Zondo Commission is going to 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 achieve that. I think we can then begin to, and I suppose maybe this is just, you know, that where, where people are held accountable. I, th I think that that's the frustration that a lot of people are feeling, um, that there has been a lack of accountability um, and the looting has continued. Um, and I, I, I think that might start to, we, when we see some accountability, we might start to begin to close that chapter. Well, I got the sense that, that what he was talking about is that the focus is not only on accountability, but that we need to start understanding how the system is going to be fixed. And the work yeah. that has, has started ever since uh, President Ramaphosa has come in, sometimes not too visible uh, for, for whatever reason, but you do get a sense that there are bits and pieces that are being done. Um, and, and I suppose what he is alluding to is, is the fixing up really has to become the focus, not necessarily only the amount of money that was stolen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely that is part of it. Um, you know, that is definitely one of the outcomes is, is that I think he talked about, you know, leaving an understanding uh, for future generations to see what happened so that they don't repeat it. Um, you know, I think that that's a very strong message of his. Is it's you know he, he listed as you said the, there were a number of outcomes, understanding what happened, understanding the damage that was caused, um, understanding who the the people and how they were allowed uh, to, to do what they did, and then looking at at how it can be fixed and repaired. So so as we move towards closure. The role of his wife, Vani, uh, gets alluded to towards the end and, and is, is, is called the strong government, uh, mm -hmm. uh, the government at home. J just, just share a bit about what your kind of discussions have been, the research, but also what others have said about the role that Vani has played in, in, in province life. So, okay, I, um, it, it, it took us a long time to get her uh, to, to agree to an interview. I think she's she may even be as shy as as Pravin. And in fact, um, the interview took place after the the script ha had been edited, and so we managed to then re we felt it was very important, and we managed to to rework it into or work it into into the script. Um, but I, I think. <laughs> What you need to know about uh, 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 Pravid, uh, about Vani probably can be or about their relationship can be summed up is when um, you know after that whole uh, uh, nanny gate um, when uh, Zuma called Pravin and and asked him if he, if 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 he would take on the the Minister of Finance. Uh, again, to try and calm the markets after the, the that weekend kind of imploded the country and the bottom fell out. Um, the, the 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 person that 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 Pravin called was Varni to, to to discuss it with, and I think that, that that shows the level of their relationship. And it was only after they had discussed it, and uh, you know, at, at that I don't think he wanted to take it on, but I think she she she. 
sort of maybe persuaded him. Um, and I, 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 you know, he, she has supported him, and she has stood with him. And I, I think he, you know he's quite quite strong about the fact that uh, you know if, if he hadn't had the this family to support him during the, those terrible times when he was the target of of, of this abuse. Um, you know, he, he might not have managed and dealt with it as, uh, you know, as, as, as he could have. Um, but yeah, I, I think she, she, she was an activist um, uh, that they met in the 70s. Uh, they, they sort of, you know, were political activists first. They, they, their relationship developed only much later. Um, and I think they're very close. He, uh, Pravin is very protective of his family and, and uh, you know, of his wife and, and, and his children. And um, uh, you know what she has to say about the, the the corruption and the people that they were activists with, um, and how they've become corrupt. I think is quite heartbreaking. I mean, you, you know, to read. So th there's a question from Judith Answer here. Uh, mm. Has Pravin read the book, and if so, what did you think of it? I'd better answer that because so that, because there's no conflict of interest. <laughs> the, um, he he was sent the book, and to this day we don't know whether he's read it or not, and what he thinks about it. Uh, we <laughs> it's been a source of some anxiety for us, but um, he hasn't said a word, and so we we don't know. Well, well I did send him the. A blurb for this event, uh, uh, you know, with, with the hope that he would have attended as well. But I'm, I'm not sure. I can't see from here who's in attendance. As we close, his term of office would come to an end in 2024. Um, his term of office in, as an NEC member of the ANC comes up next year in 2022. What, what's been your sense about his own thinking beyond 2024? I think broadly speaking, he, um, yeah, I think he ha they have discussed his retiring and the family, have, it seems we've heard from other people have put some pressure on him to retire. Um, but it's a very, very difficult question to answer because he's 72 years old now. Uh, he's a, still pr describes himself as an activist and he's committed and, and a very hardworking man. And he's obviously got astonishing energy. We, Sometimes we're exhausted after interviews and he would switch off and go off to other meetings. But um, so it's a difficult one to answer, but I imagine he's probably thinking about, um, you know, a couple more years and he'll, he'll move out of politics. Let me thank both of you. I think this has been fascinating. The book itself uh, for me has just been a revelation. There's so much that I didn't know about somebody that, that I thought I knew. Uh, from, from a distance, albeit. Um, I think the, the contribution of Pravin w w is something that we will begin to appreciate and understand with much greater depth in, in, in the years to come, as I think more information comes forward, really about the, 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 the kind of the depth of the fight back that he and, and, and Derek and others had to, in fact, mount both within the ANC and within government. So far, we know very little, which is why people think that people like him and others should have left. They, they should have uh, left the ANC. They should have left cabinet. I know both he and Derek and others thought that had they done that, the country would have been worse off. That, I suppose, mm -hmm. will still be, be an issue for debate for many for, for, for the long while to come. Uh, so just to thank all of you, to thank News24 as well, um, Sean, uh, for, thank you. for pulling this together, and over to you. Thanks very much, everyone. Lovely thank to you. see you. Great. Thank you. Thank you.